We're thankful to the Lord that you could join us this evening for our Wednesday night prayer meeting here at uh, Calvary Baptist Church in Larkspur, California. We invite you to take your Bibles and turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, last uh, Wednesday evening, we uh, looked at two things that happen when we get saved. When we get saved, we have access to the, God's grace and we're adopted into the family of God. Now this evening, we are going to look at two more things that happen when we get saved. Uh, we have an inheritance and we are elected. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we could gather in thy precious name and in thy presence this evening. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we uh, in spite of the heat, uh, can have a, a place that is uh, cooled and comfortable. Thank you, Lord, that we can open the Word of God and hear from you. And thank you for just every blessing that you give us. Pray now that you will bless your Word to our hearts. And I pray these things that we are looking at uh, will encourage us as we walk with thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, number one, we have an inheritance. If you'll notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Peter tells us here of our inheritance that it's incapable of decay. Uh, it's incapable of defilement. Uh, it's incapable of default. It speaks of an inherited, uh, the idea here, the inheritance, uh, like we would talk about an inherited property. Uh, it has to do with our future condition uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, when he sends up uh, the new order, taking things to effect, that and what we have beyond that. Uh, remember, we're joint heirs with Christ, the Bible says. Now, if you receive an inheritance today, a physical one in... Uh, in one way or the other, um, it's capable of decay. Uh, if you inherit money, a home, a car, land, whatever, eventually uh, the money will disappear. Um, when that comes uh, and uh, the um, car will stop running, uh, the land will disappear eventually when the new heaven and new earth, the home will fall apart. Uh, those are what happens with normal inheritances. The moment you and I begin to live, we begin to die. Man's mightiest monuments succumb. When we look at the pyramids today, and we're so impressed with the way they look and everything, but we know now that they were much more impressive. That wind and other things have taken a great deal of the outer shell of them away. Uh, and they're not what they uh, were originally. Uh, when we look at uh, in museums, or I never went there, but if you went to uh, Greece uh, and would see the statuary that they have from way a long time ago, thousands of years ago, and you look at it and you're impressed and you say, wow, this is incredible. But you're not seeing the way it was. It was all painted, uh, very lifelike. Uh, we look at it as stone, uh, cold marble, uh, but it was very different than that. But time has changed that. Not only that, if you'll notice, many of them have lost limbs. Uh, you know, even those, even marble and all those things. So things decay, um, but our inheritance is not like that at all. 
we have an inheritance that is incapable of decay. Uh, our inheritance both incorruptible and undefiled. That word undefiled means free from all con uh, contamination. Our inheritance will not defile us. Think about that. It will not defile us. Some inheritance have ruined people. Uh, you know, people who maybe have had no experience in handling, say if it's a money inheritance, they have no way of handling that and they get a lot of money. Just like people win the lottery or something and it's not too long before they lose the whole thing. Um, and uh, it can defile them. Remember the prodigal son? He looked to his dad and he said, uh, give me my inheritance and his dad gave him an inheritance. Uh, but what happened to him? Uh, he went out and lived a riotous life. Uh, he eventually ended up uh, working in a pigsty uh, and uh, had nothing. It really destroyed him. Uh, thankfully that uh, he came to his senses and went to his father. Undefiled also speaks of the title without defect. Uh, this inheritance has a clear title. It's not flawed. Uh, if you've ever had an inheritance, uh, you might find out that uh, in some cases, uh, they actually have to uh, notify others in the family. Uh, that happened to my sister and I. We didn't have, there wasn't a will, but we were supposed to, obviously we were the only ones left. My dad was died to inherit the, what my mother had left. We, the, our lawyers had to notify everybody in the family and ask them not to, uh, you know, contest the whole thing. They could have. Uh, they could have somehow or other, uh, not saying that they would have won, but people do that. Even wills that have been written up by great lawyers and have all the safeguards, people go to court and they don't always uh, make it. And then sometimes the things that you get may not have a clear title. You may not be able to keep it. Uh, a court cannot take away our inheritance. The title is clear, it's clean, and thus it's undefiled. And he says here that our inheritance does not fade away. It's not like an earthly one. They tend to vanish. It's solid, it's substantial, it's made of the same kind of stuff that eternity is made of. It will last forever. The inheritance promises unending delights forever. We don't know what it all is. We don't know what all God has for us. In fact, I believe that if he told us we'd be sitting there going like, uh, I don't know what it is. I still don't know what it is. I don't understand it. Uh, it might be like uh, um, maybe years ago when people first uh, entered into Papua New Guinea and some of those areas. Uh, one of the great shocks that they had was uh, in the 1930s, as far as we know, the first time anybody had ever seen the interior of that was somebody flew a plane over it. Uh, those people had never seen a plane as far as we know. No one had flown over that area. Uh, can you imagine? They probably just thought it was a bird that was a little strange. It didn't flap its wings. Uh, and uh, so it was, uh, it was very, very different. Uh, so what does God have for us? Uh, I don't know what all he has for us. But if it's from him and he loves us and he has all things, then we have to know that it's all going to be good. It's all going to be wonderful. It's going to be some things that we will enjoy for eternity. Uh, we enjoy a lot of things today in our lives. We, we enjoy a lot of things that we have and everything, but we can't even compare those to what God's going to have for us. Um, the inheritance, by the way, is reserved in heaven for us. That word reserve means that it is guarded, kept, and preserved. The other idea is it's watch over. Imagine that. 
God has an inheritance for us and he's watching over it. Now you could order uh, uh, higher brinks to uh, protect some of your inheritance. Uh, you could, uh, uh, you know, I, when I go walking, I see people have signs outside their home that they're, uh, they're guarded by this or that or the other. You know, you can actually buy those signs like that and stick them in your yard and not have it, uh, or you may have it. But, uh, the, but those aren't even sure. Uh, and, but God is watching over our inheritance. It's preserved, it's reserved for us by God's power. How many earthly inheritance have been stolen? How many lost poor, by poor investments? How many banks or loan companies have failed? Uh, mismanagement, all kinds of things happen to inheritances. And then notice he says here, for you, for you. He's talking to believers. It's not for the unsaved. It's only for those who have been redeemed, those who have been saved. People are, of our world will never receive this inheritance. Their riches are limited to this world. The inheritance of the redeemed is obviously far superior and is forever. And then go over to Colossians in chapter 3. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. And verse 24. Paul writes here, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Uh, many times an inheritance is shared. Uh, mine was with my sister. Uh, we had to divide everything in half. Uh, and no matter how much may be in an estate, most of the time, or oftentimes, it gets divided up. It's different with our inheritance. Number one, it is a gift. It's a free gift. Uh, no one can earn this inheritance. Uh, not only that, but it is each one of us individually totally receive the complete inheritance. It's not divided up. So, now wait a minute. You know, if there's whatever it's all out there, but that's what God's saying. That's part of eternity. That's part of being on a child of God. That's part of Christ. We all get all the same. All of it. That's fantastic. <coughs> it never ends. The writer of Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews 9, And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. It is willed to each and every believer by the Lord. And therefore, it is our right as believers. It is our right to have what God has preserved for us. And so the first thing here <coughs> tonight is we have an inheritance. The second is found in Ephesians chapter 1 and some other places. Now I know this is one of those areas where sometimes people get a little uncomfortable maybe. Um, they uh, have heard different things. Uh, the Bible tells us that we're elected, we're chosen by God. Uh, what all that entails, uh, we're not going to go into all of that and we're not going to do a whole theological study of, of uh, the different positions and everything like that. 
let's just take what the Bible says. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now this is a mystery. We are finite. We are limited in our knowledge, our understanding, and all those things. But God is infinite. And so there are going to be things that God may reveal to us, but he doesn't totally explain them to us. And so we don't totally understand them. But we know this is what God has said. This is his plan. This is what he's done. Uh, we're creatures of time. God inhabits uh, in eternity. Uh, we're hindered in our experiences. Our understanding is limited by the very nature of our being. Uh, in, as finite creatures, uh, we live in here and now, and we can deal only with one thing at a time. Um, we live moment by moment. Um, now, we may be able to anticipate the future. Um, we can recall the past if we still remember, but um, the future is swallowed and all. We can look back, but we really don't know the future. For God is very different. God is ever present. That's why he said in the Old Testament when he's asked his name by Moses, I am that I am. I am. That's in the present. For all eternity, God is in the present. Now, it's a little hard maybe sometimes to understand this, but if we would uh, understand eternity isn't this way, but let's say the eternity is going that way and then going that way. And you and I are here in this, a, little, a little pinpoint. We're here. But God is there and here and here and here and here and here and here and here. He's present everywhere, all the time. And so what he has done in the past, what he's done in now, what he's doing in the future. In God's mind, however, the past, the present, and the future are swallowed up in the all-embracing present. Uh, thus, when we read that we're chosen in him before the foundation of the world, we realize the Holy Spirit has stated the issue from our perspective. This is looking at it so we can have somewhat of an idea. Uh, God choosing is totally, totally by grace. Uh, it's impossible for us to totally understand it. Uh, Spurgeon said this, he said, if God hasn't chosen me before the foundation of the world, he wouldn't choose me now. <laughs> now, we need to note that God chose us even before he created the universe, before he created us. Now, some people want to go and say, well, uh, our soul or our spirit existed at that time. No, the Bible doesn't teach us that at all. Uh, that's not true. We were created when God created us. Our soul and spirit was created then. So we, we weren't back then. We will always be, but we have always been. Um, so our salvation is wholly of His grace and not based on anything that we ourselves have done. Period. It's all of grace. And He chose us in Christ, not in ourselves. So why did He choose us? Well, notice what He says here that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God saves us. That's verse 4, this is the second half of the verse. Look at it again. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God saves us, he sanctifies us, he sees no blemish in us when he saves us. Because Christ's death on the cross has taken all that away. So when he sees us, he sees Christ. He sees the blood. He sees Christ's righteousness. And by the way, his love can be content with nothing less than our complete, 
Christ-likeness. And there's a practical purpose of his grace. The full realization of Christ's likenessness awaits the coming day when we shall be like him for when we see him as he is. That day is coming. I believe that when uh, what we call the rapture, the taken away, uh, when we meet him in the air, we will be totally transformed. We will become like him. That means we will have an eternal body. Our soul and spirit will come. That will be eternal. We will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in, and all of the past is gone. We will finally, totally, completely be like Christ. Now we're striving in that direction. But that will be the final thing. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. He's working in our hearts to produce that. Here now, the same quality of unblemished holiness that characterized the Lord Jesus Christ when he lived on the earth, he is changing us. If he's not changing you, then he's having to chastise you. If he's not doing one of the two, then there's a serious problem. Christ-likeness is our goal. It should be the, it's the driving force of love. Infinite love for us and our increase in love for him. The more we love him, the more we want to be like him. The more we want to put aside those things that are not like him. And then going over to 1 Peter again. It's interesting how uh, in our studies, uh, we've been here for a while in 1 Peter and some of these other places, and uh, it's amazing how much that Peter, uh, how much doctrine, how much truth uh, that he has. Uh, we have a tendency, we can look at Luke, well, that was a doctor. Uh, Matthew, well, you know, he was a tax collector. He was probably well-educated and all that. And we look at Peter and we think, well, he was just a fisherman. But this is the proof of the inspiration of Scripture when you think about it. Because God took that man who had some education, uh, not like the others, but he did have education because that was what the Jewish people did. But the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Breathe into him God's word. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, he says, uh, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, by obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That word elect means called out ones. It means to pick out or to select. That's why we use the word chosen. Those who are saved were chosen by God in the deep counsels of eternity. We don't know anything about it. We didn't know anything about it until it was revealed to us in the Word of God. This election is not based on anything we have done because we were not even on the sea. Nor is it based on anything God saw that we would do. A lot of people teach that. They said, well, God saw what you were going to do, and so God then said, oh, well, you're going to accept the Lord, then I'm going to choose you. If that's so, where is God? And why did Jesus even have to die? Again, God's election was based completely on his grace and love. We can't explain it. But we can rejoice in it. We can give him praise because, listen, if he hadn't, we wouldn't. We would be lost. Now, some people have a little bit of trouble. They come with the word foreknowledge, and they say, ah, oh, foreknowledge, and that means that God knew ahead of time. And in our normal use of the word, uh, that's legitimate. But that's not how it is used in the scriptures. 
Um, to foreknow in the Bible means to set one's love upon a person or persons in a personal way. Uh, it's like what God did with Israel. Remember, God said very clearly, you, there was nothing great about you, there was nothing about you to choose or anything. I just set my love upon you. He just made that choice. Uh, in fact, in Amos, the same word but in Hebrew is used, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. That's what he speaks about of Israel. So he set his electing love on that nation. And there are other verses that use that no in that very real sense. Uh, let me read some to you. In uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 8 and verse 3. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Uh, it, back in John's Gospel and chapter 10, and you probably can almost anticipate uh, the verses that we're going to read here. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. And verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse uh, 23. And when I will declare to them, I have never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He never knew them. Now, the plan of salvation includes more than God's electing love. It also includes the work of the Spirit in convicting and bringing us to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, go back a little bit in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians and let's go to uh, chapter 2 in verses 13 and 14. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel, for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. There would be no salvation without that. We have been chosen by the Father, we have been purchased by the Son, and we have been set apart by the Holy Spirit. It takes all three to experience true salvation. Now, some people, when they hear about election, they say, well, then I don't have to witness anybody. I don't have to share the gospel because God's elected them and they're just going to automatically get saved. Hogwash. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that one of the things that God has called us to do is to go out and witness, to share the gospel. I don't know who's going to get saved. Uh, you know, when I preach a, a salvation message or I give an invitation or I hand out a track or whatever, I don't know who will respond or not. I have no idea. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to give forth the gospel. My responsibility, our responsibility is to share the good news with everyone. And we leave the rest in God's hands. I can't save anybody. Uh, we have a... I've heard people over the years say, oh, I, I got somebody saved. Or I, I remember when I was a young Christian, I'd hear people say, uh, I saved somebody. You know, as young men, we would be out witnessing on the street and stuff and handing out tracts. And you come back and somebody would say, I saved somebody. And some wiser, usually a senior or junior, would take them aside and say, you didn't save anybody. 
You know, God is the one who saves. You just witness and share the gospel. Uh, but we are to do that. Um, I always like to point out to folks, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was very strong. He was what we would call a five-point Calvinist. In fact, when they built the church, the uh, permanent church metropolitan tabernacle in London, um, he uh, inaugurated it uh, Monday through Friday. And he literally preached Monday, Wednesday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday on the five points of Calvinism. That's what he taught. Um, but it's so interesting that the same man would preach. He didn't give the public invitation that we kind of have kind of adopted from uh, actually a man by the name of Finney. But on, I think it was like on Tuesday morning, people would come to the church and stand outside down the hall in his office and come in to see him one at a time so that he might lead them to Christ. He was a great soul winner. Now that's balance. The, God, the same God who ordained the end, our salvation, has also ordained the means to the end, preaching of the gospel of God's wonderful grace to everyone. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you that again we've had the privilege of opening your word and seeing that which you have done for us when we get saved. All of this is grace. We have access to your grace. That we are adopted into the family of God. And uh, that we have an inheritance eternal in the heavens reserved for us by you. And that we have been chosen. Don't understand it all. We just rejoice and thank you and praise you. And may we be good stewards of the truth and the gospel to share it with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.